I was I was I was doing my uh, research, and in 1969, you were the winner of the Surfer Poll. Yeah, actually, that 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 poll didn't come out until 1970. Okay, I didn't know about it until I was in basic training in the army. Okay, and one of the drill sergeants. I was walking down the company street. I don't know what I was doing, walking out in the street. You know, maybe it was a weekend or something. Mm -hmm. I had a little free time. And one of the drill sergeants comes walking up to me with a copy of Surfer magazine in his hand. He says, is this you? <laughs> <laughs> I went, oh, God, yeah, it's me. You know, and so immediately the, sus the suspicion was that I was running away from something. They had done something bad that uh -huh. I wasn't telling about. Or that they, they couldn't see or they didn't, they didn't hear about, you know, on the surface. And so, therefore... I was suspect, uh -huh. and so I was picked on after that for a few oh, months. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That was Jock Sutherland. I'm Jamie Brissick. This is Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Surfer's Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More like a book than a magazine, TSJ brings you 128 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Jock Sutherland is 75 years old. He spent most of his life on the North Shore of Oahu, he won Surfer Magazine's Reader Poll Awards in 1969. He won many titles, among them the 1967 Duke and the Hawaiian State Championships in 67, 68, and 69. He finished second to Nat Young in the 1966 World Championships in San Diego. This was the contest that kicked off the shortboard revolution. But I know of Jock away from the contest milieu. He was one of the top pipeline surfers back in the early days, a pioneering tube rider, an archaeological tube writer, you might say. He experimented with psychedelics, and there's a legendary story about Jock night surfing Waimea Bay on acid, which we'll get into in the conversation. There's a break on the North Shore named after Jock. Jockos, I've surfed it a whole bunch, a bouncy left, which can occasionally do a freakish half-pipe thing. Jock grew up looking out into it. In early 1970, while most surfers were dodging the draft, Jock joined the U.S. Army. He has a son, Gavin Sutherland, who's a North Shore lifeguard and an ace aerialist. Jock and I spoke in the backyard of my good friends Garth Murphy and Uva Anderson's house in Encinitas, California. I was blown away by Jock's ease, flow, levity. He laughed easily. He seemed like a teenager trapped in a septuagenarian's body. Jock Sutherland, welcome to the show. Thank you, my friend Jamie. Um, so let's go back to the very beginning. Do you remember... Um, your first wave, your first session, when, you, when did you start surfing? Probably, Jimmy and my dad had me on a, on a board very briefly in some small rollers in front of our house in Surfside, perhaps 1950, 51, somewhere in there. And then after that, I don't remember any of those, but uh, when we came over to Hawaii in 1952, we were in the Waikiki area and in the Kailua area on Oahu, the, the windward side and then the south side, as that um, I'm pretty sure that we went into some smaller rollers there, but I don't remember specifically any of the ways before, say, I was, you know, six, seven, eight years old, which was when I, I started using one of my dad's old boards, perhaps a little bit later, maybe when I was eight, uh, my, my dad's old balsa boards in, in some soft rollers, kind of like Waikiki at the uh, Naval Air Station, which is where my mom had a special services job. And they, I was mostly by myself, learning by myself. Uh, but still, I, I, my mom was a swimmer and dad was a fisherman as well as a surfer. And so I'm sure that I had some fairly substantial wave exposure as well as ocean and fish exposure before the time I was six or eight years old. But when I was eight or nine, I was able to go to the, to the, to the ocean a couple times a week or so and, and just paddle on these slow rollers. And, and at first uh, I was parallel foot, you know, and mom said, well, he's got to learn to put, be able to, in her diary, you know, he's got to be able to learn to put one foot in front of each other. And finally figured out I was goofy foot, but in that, in that space of time between 
13 and 16, 17 years old, I, I became comfortable enough with it because the North Shore has got so many waves mm -hmm. and so many different types and, and energies of, of waves that I was able to become competent enough to ride Waimea or Good Size Sunset and even you know, for a lark, go backside at pipeline for the heck of it. Wow. And just, okay, can I do this? Wow. Because on, on those boards back then, it was easy to track because the boards weren't as, didn't have the, the radius uh, on the newer boards, uh, say after 67 or 68. So it would be real easy to get stuck in the face, especially if you were to be a little bit too eager on the takeoff and you weren't over the center of the board and you were more on the rail and the board would tend to, track on you and then you know you'd be skipping down the face of a 15 foot way trying to claw your way under and then you go over the falls backwards and mm -hmm. but so uh, if you learned how to fade and this is one of the things that we as young guys started to, to not taunt each other but we nor goad each other taunting and goading aren't good words but galvanize say each mm -hmm. other into doing what they would say one guy would take off and said yeah i just faded you know whether or not it was on purpose and, and it be, became on purpose, you know, it's faded a little bit on that and the board set real nice, you know, and then, you know, uh, my bottom turn was easier. And, and so that was one thing we, we learned that and, and instead of dropping in straight, you know, to have your do, Jeff especially w would, was one of the first guys I would see do that. Uh, w would be Jeff Hackman? Yeah. yeah. He was my college, after he won the first Duke uh, and a couple of years later I w was, lucky enough to win the third Duke when Duke was still alive, that uh, Jeff was one of the, uh, Jeff invited me after I had won that third Duke contest in, in uh, late 67, as we went to school together uh, uh, in a community college over on Maui. We surfed Honolulu a bunch, all before chords, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you learn to surf conservatively, mm -hmm. but uh, we would push each other. Okay. Uh, as well as other guys from Honolulu, like Jimmy Lucas and, and Kiki Spangler, Jackie Eberly, these guys, we're, we're all part of the my peer group. Yep. And so we would say, well, that was a good wave, or, you know, you think that was good, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, kind of like the momentum generation only 30 years, was it 40? 30 years, say, <laughs> 30 years previously. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, when, when I and others of my age watched a movie like The Momentum Generation, going, oh, that's that, that's good stuff, you know. They're, they're pushing each other you know, a little bit further, and at places like back door, and, mm -hmm. and so the consequences, you know. I mean, we we would get hurt a little bit, but guys, when you're at, at back door, you know, and your boards are smaller, you know, you face plant a little bit easier, or yes, you get you get the beaver beaver mass fell or the Chris Lundy injuries. Yeah, no, I've seen uh, I've seen the clips, and the boards are uh, kind of cumbersome and don't really fit. Yeah, and, yeah. Back then, although we were. We were writing some brewers from the time from like 1965 or so. Okay. And, and there's also some Kearns and some other people that were shaping good boards like, uh, uh, you know, George Downey and, and Wally Froyce. More Normally we wouldn't see their boards out there. They'd be mostly out of Makaha or, or in, in Honolulu. But uh, Greg Knoll had a shop there in, in Kaimaki from like 64 or 65. And I actually was riding for him when I, when I won the Duke contest. So, and he would come out to the North Shore when we lived out there in the 50s and stopped by my house and he would say stuff when, when we were on stage, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I knew Jack when he was crapping in his diapers and I'm like, oh, thanks a lot, boss. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what are you going to say to Greg? You know? Yes. Um, how did you find your way out to Pipeline and when? when? Well, probably in about 63 or 64, the guys, because I didn't have a car back then, I was like 14, 15 years old. Uh, the guys from town, Jimmy Lucas, uh, Kiki Spangler, because Kiki was a little older, he could drive one of the cars that Jimmy's dad had at the car lot. They would come out and take me from Chun's and take me down to Pipe and stuff. And probably when I was 14 years old or so, mm -hmm. uh, I started surfing a little bit of Pipe. And then when I could get more rides uh, up there, that by the time I was 16, you know, I was riding a little bit more. And when I was a senior in high school, you know, I was able to get up there a little bit more, and that was when, and even 66, even, even for the couple of years from 66 to 68, that there was some days when it would be perfect, six or eight feet, and nobody would be out. Oh, my shoulder's sore. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I got to mow the lawn. You go out, you know, <laughs> so you'd be out there by yourself, and it'd be perfect. Wow. So, 
And at that time, were there were there people to look up to and sort of show you the way as to how the line that you would draw on these yeah. waves? Yeah, like like Butch. Okay. And say, Jose Angel wasn't so much of a finesse guy, but he would be out there because he would be out there uh, taking off on some some screamers. But there was there was a, an older group that were like Butch was was the main guy as far as being able to show us where you could take off. Yeah, uh, and he had big boards, but he was just a strong guy, and he had good legs. And because he was raised in in like places like Winnensee and Big Rock, that he had the ability to take off on steep waves and 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 be confident. You know, yes. um, top turns. Say. Yep, yep, you yep. Know, a, a top turn at pipe is very risky, but if you're quick on your feet, as he was, you know, mm-hmm. very gifted athlete, mm-hmm. that uh, he could he could make it look easy. And so we took pages out of his book. And was the line pretty much drop in, angle down the face and pull on the tube, or was there a hooking bottom turn before you got in there, or how did that well, go? Yeah, bottom turns were fairly common because to be able to do a, an angle turn and, and then set your line was, was pretty difficult because of how steep it got. So yep. you, you didn't, if, if you were going to drop straight in, you wanted to make sure to get your feet quick enough so you could get to the bottom quick enough. Mm-hmm. But a slight angle was usually the MO because... Uh, on the, on the older boards in '63 or '64, if you took too straight of a drop, almost guaranteed you were going to pearl because there wasn't enough nose rocker and the boards weren't that maneuverable. Um, one one remarkable uh, accomplishment is second place in the 1966 World Championships in La Jolla, if I'm not, or somewhere in San Diego, At Ocean Beach, behind yes. Nat Young. Yes, behind yeah. Nat Young, which which is um, often regarded as the beginning of the short, shortboard revolution. Yeah, t- it it uh, pretty clearly was. Yeah, the Australians probably. Through maybe one of the made their made their major influences was uh, Green, George Greeno on his velo on his kneeboard, mm-hmm. and and you know showing them what could be done as far as uh, being in the pocket and maneuvering and climbing and dropping. Mm-hmm. You know there was a lot of straight line surfing, although at Sunset Beach where, and places like Lania Kea where there's a big open face, you know you're climbing and dropping to get speed, but the boards weren't allowing you to do it easily enough. And so it wasn't, you know, that thing, that sort of thing where you're that comfortable. But uh, going back to the early 60s and late 50s, you had Pat Curran, you know, on, on the street line mm-hmm. uh, driving. But uh, because the boards were better in the late 50s and 60s than they were, you know, before that, even though Wally Frost had had boards that he was shaping for Makaha that had more of a pointy nose and more of a drawn-in tail. and I was lucky enough to be at a house where I was doing some repair for this fellow Frey Heath in Manoa, that uh, whose, whose dad was Fran Heath, who was a, a surfing contemporary of Wally Froyseth and George Downing, going back to the big square-tailed uh, early days uh, of the uh, 30s, where because there was no fins, they weren't able to go very close to the wave, very parallel to the wave, and so they would always be like spinning out, sliding out. And so they, so the story goes, and it's pretty much documented, that uh, Frey's dad, Fran, came in one day, and John Kelly and I think Wally Frost, maybe George Downing were there, and they took out some axes and draw knives because they were so tired of this sliding out thing that they wanted to go closer and closer to the curl, you know, so mm-hmm. they could ride the wave closer to where the curl was that they chopped down Mr. Heath's tail of his board. It was like a, a, maybe a redwood board back then. And they chopped down the, you know, like from two feet back towards the tail. They, ch- they narrowed down the tail with draw knives and axes and <laughs> maybe sanded it a little bit with some rasps or something. Uh-huh. And, and, and they went out and tried it again, and it worked because it was able to hold in, still without skegs. Yeah. Skegs wouldn't come around until Tom Blake, maybe the late 30s or so. And Frey said, Jock, I want, I want you to show, I want to show you something. And he showed me the board. Oh, wow. The, the, from, from like 80 years ago. Incredible. But, and was the tail really crudely yeah, slashed? Yeah, around? yeah, yeah. You could wow. see. You Amazing. could see it was all there. You could see the age of the board. Uh-huh. And he said that Randy Rurick dearly would love to have had that. And I made offers from, Frey, come on, you know, give me, sell me that board. You can make good money off of it. But Frey's going, no, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. I, I really am uh-huh. sorry, Randy. Right. But no. <laughs> so, uh, so as a great surfer of this time and watching the, the board design change pretty rapidly, was it, um, was it incredibly liberating? I mean, I know. I, oh, yeah. Because I... yeah, uh, we grew up, you know, riding the, you know, 
pretty crude equipment. You know, like my dad, one of my first surfboards was a, a pipo board, a balsa pipo board that was maybe, maybe six feet long, and he glued a section on the tail, and there was no rocker, only belly. Very hard board to ride, but seeing pictures of George Downing riding the old hot curl boards at Haleiwa and one of the Duke contest clips. They had George pouting out to Haleiwa on a six-foot day, riding one of these heavy old redwood boards with no fin, and he could do it. Mm -hmm. But it was very easy to catch an edge and very tough to ride. Uh -huh. So that's how a lot of us younger guys started out, was on the really hard-to-ride boards with hardly any rocker and, and heavy. But to me, the, the main the main turning point for me as far as what could be thought of, what could be imagined was when Dick Brewer, maybe it was the early winter of 66 or so, the Jeff Hagman paddled up to Chun's on a four foot day and he had an 810, 88 or an 810 pintail. And he said, here, try this. Okay. And I turned, I dropped in and I hit a turn and just went, uh -huh. I just kind of went back up the wave and I'm going, whoa, okay. Right. And so. You uh, traded in the Cadillac for a Porsche or a Ferrari. Yeah, yeah basically yeah. it was uh, the made the sea change. Yep. So you had this new board design to rise smaller, more maneuverable surfboards. Right. You had the great um, canvas that is Honolulu Bay. Right. As and, well as as well as the north side of uh, Wailuka when the winds got good. Yep. Or, or Hokeepa. And then the thing that's always intrigued me about that time is psychedelics were coming in there as well. Oh, they were. So so I'm thinking the board, you know, the psychedelics may not may have not um, been as effective if you were riding nine six logs, but you're on these maneuverable boards where your imagination can kind of go all over the place. Right. As Nat Young said, let let your mind run. Yeah. Which surfing tends to give you anyway but yeah. if you have if you're more impressed in your own ability and doing you know flashy stuff for you know even if there's not a camera this is the way that surfing should be you know all these showy things you know but so you're in this period where you and jeff hackman are living together you're in community college you're you've got the shorter boards you've got the great waves you've and got, got the some psychedelics and we've got some good connections like dick was kind of brewer was kind of our guru back then as a matter of fact at his services a friend of mine who was an old photographer from maui and he had some shirts with the picture from, I think, 1967 of iconic picture of Dick sitting with cross legs in kind of a Buddha pose up against the, the, the outside of a building in Makiki uh, next door to Manoa uh, of a water building, old, old style water building with Reno Abelera and Jerry Lopez doing handstands in front of him. I know the Yeah, 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 so yeah, 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 yeah. So, so great. And, 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 and Dave Darling made a shirt that had had that picture, a black and white with the on three sides of the picture. It said, "Clean food, clean shapes, clean living." Yes. <laughs> no, you know, it's I'm I um, I was very influenced by that stuff when I came to surfing because a lot of the guys that I looked up to were still. There was, you know, I learned about health, going to health food stores yeah. as a young man. My family weren't going there, but I learned it from surfers. But that, um, what was it like? I mean, what what, did it, what was it like in the mid late sixties? Um, going surfing in Honolulu, taking a little dose before and paddling out was just... It was part and parcel. You know, if you had done, taking care of your, your other, your chores and your car was running okay, like Dick Brewer was sometimes in Lahaina, he'd help us out with the mechanics because he was, he was a car guy from early on, the early 60s, Dick was. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dick helped us on all that, but as far as he, he was, we would sometimes go to his house like three or four, five of us guys, us like Jimmy Lucas, Kiki, maybe Jeff, and I would maybe Jackie. We we'd take some acid over there at Dick's house, and then we'd go up into the mountains. We would be running around up the mountains, swimming, you know, having guava fights and stuff, you know, having a good time coming on in a natural surrounding, which is key. Yeah, very very key. You, know, yep. you don't want to be coming on in a car, yeah. you know, or inside of a you know a, a nice house is okay as long as it's quiet, but uh, you know people. Oftentimes, their minds aren't settled or their minds aren't <sighs> foundationed enough, you know, in, an, in a natural world. You know, maybe they've been raised, you know, they've been maybe driven as kids a little bit. And so they've got, you know, these worries and these fears and these insecurities. And so it's tough for them. You know, yeah. you, you kind of don't want to be taking acid if it's in a, in a not so natural setting or if you've got other things on your mind because... It's gonna get it's gonna get down to the nitty gritty, mm -hmm. and but if you, you know, you're happy with the way you've been raised, you, you know, you like your parents, you like your friends, and you're in a natural setting, so we do that. We, 
go up in the mountains and then we'd be up there for three or four hours and then we'd come down and go surfing. And it was like, wow, you know, this is cool. You know, mm -hmm. everything seems to be working, you know, mm -hmm. because you were tuned in. Sure. And we were, you know, we had some muscle memory to that point. Yeah. So that our, our surfing was not, you have to think about everything. Mm -hmm. but you're, gonna, you're looking down the line, you know, mm -hmm. that young thing, you know, letting your mind go ahead of itself. But you also had the, the feet and the arms and the, the hips and everything working for you. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because psychedelics have had this this great sort sort of resurgence, renaissance period right that now. Has. It has. Yeah. And the thing that I think is good about it, because in my early days of dabbling, it was sort of like on the way to go to a concert and you've already had like four beers in the back of a car and someone ham, hands you a sliver or a half or whatever. Yeah. Um, but now it's done in this very intentional, ritualistic way. And it sounds like you guys were doing it that way back then. We were trying to because we had been advised by by people who actually had contact with <clears throat> you know say uh, some people who had some of my friends were import export people so they had been to Afghanistan or they'd been to India or they they knew someone who knew real girls and I don't know if you ever, you probably read the story about Jimi Hendrix in the early days in Huntington Beach when he had done a, a, a nice gig at, at the at the Golden Bear and He's down there by the pier, and it's, it's kind of, it's, it's at night, you know, and, and Bill Fury comes up to him, and he sees Jimmy, and he says, hey, you know, man, you know, we really admired, you know, your guitar playing. What are you doing down here? And Jimmy says, well, I didn't get paid, man. I'm thinking of sleeping underneath the pier. And Bill said, no, 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 come home with me, you know. And so Jimmy went back with, with, with Bill, and, and Bill says, yeah, this is where the maybe Chuck Dent's house. You know, I've got uh -huh. a little, little, little hole underneath the, the stairway here, and, you know, hey, if you want some pot, you know, I keep some pot over here, some pretty good stuff, maybe some Acapulco gold or something, you know. The guy, Huntington Beach guys, you know, they kind of had a good connection back then. And Jimmy was going, oh, well, okay, you know, and he was cool with that. And so the next morning, because the Hells Angels w would park in a parking lot right next door to, I think, Wardy's uh, surf shop there, that the, the surfers and the Hells Angels had kind of got up, oh, are you like that? You're like, oh, okay, you know, you guys like this, you know, we like the same thing, you know, beer mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I think Bill inter introduced the Hells Angel, his Hells Angels acquaintances to, to Jimmy. They said, hey, you know, we got this place out in Santa Ana, we've got an old rock house out there, you know, maybe we can f figure out, you know, how to. And make some T-shirts, you know. We 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 really like your music, man. You know, and and so the story went that that Jimmy went with the, with the angels out there to the. I don't know if Fury was still with them, possibly, and that they were thinking of making some T-shirts and having a concert. But at right about that time, the the Hell's Angels started taking some acid, right? Mm -hmm. and they were going, Poof, oh man, you know, this this beating on and people, you know, for the hell of it, you know, that, that kind of doesn't cut it, you know. There's this whole new world. Wow, and so. The Hells Angels guys, they got together with some of the import-export guys, you know, the hash guys, you know, the pot guys, the, you know, psilocybin guys, whoever. You know, and they, they created this organization that went down and migrated down into Laguna Canyon, mm -hmm. and it became the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Right. Yeah, and yeah. that was partly... Hells Angels guys, as far as I remember, and partly import-export guys. Oh, incredible. You know. um, the shorter board under your feet, the great waves at Honolulu Bay, maybe a little bit of orange sunshine on your tongue, and then Hendrix, sound, Hendrix songs in your head when yeah, you're yeah. surfing. How great must that have been? That was cool because the guys who are friends of mine up there in upcountry Maui, when I was going to, Jeff had already moved back to Oahu. Maybe he was pursuing a little bit more of a surfing career because he had already won the first Duke and he had some sponsors. So he was maybe more into the beginning of the pro surf tour, which was in very young stage that I was living up in up country, you know, Kula, you know, a couple thousand feet. And some friends of mine who also lived up there were uh, pretty, mm, shall we say, substantial players in the import export market. Mm -hmm. And they and they taught me, oh, you know, take these seeds, you know, grow yourself a little pot on your roof. You know, the, they like the roof times, rooftop sun. And they, they said, you got to listen to this. It's like Jimmy Page. Mm -hmm. And and uh, cream, uh -huh, you know. Uh -huh. And this is like late '68, you know, early '69, and so and so that 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 kind of music, you know, lent itself very easily to the the transcendental uh, 
impulse, not impulses, but the transcendental influence of the transcendental substances yes. that you could use as an assist. Yes. So it, was, it wasn't, it was hardly ever an end in itself, even though you go over to these guys' house, hey, you know, let's, let's have a couple of doobies, you know, listen to some music, have a beer or two, you know, have some food. So it was very convivial, and these guys were supportive of me because at that time, you know, I was already, I already had a little bit of a reputation, you know, as a pretty good, you know, kid surfer, young mm -hmm, surfer. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that I like to attribute to not only growing up in the North Shore, but having guys like Jose Angel and Wally, Wally Frost and George Downing and Buzzy Trent and mm -hmm. Peter Cole, all the, all those, the California guys that used mm -hmm. to come to Makaha, as well as the Hawaii guys, all these pioneers going, hey, you know, we know your mom, we know your dad, you yeah. know, hey, you know, we'll show you the lineup. So the, the influence of, of, of being taken underneath these guys' wings, like Buzzy. Yeah. Show, hey, Jock, here's the lineup over here. You see that, 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 that you know, that tree in there and the, the part of the mountain back up in there, you know, and having them tell, you know, having them say, come on, Jock, this is a good wave. Jose Angel wow. did that to me once at Wine Man on a 25-foot day. Uh -huh. He said, come on, Jock, here's a good wave, you know, this is a nice one, you know. So, oh, yeah, okay, you know, I'm, I'm like... Uh, 18 years old or so, mm -hmm. but I'm on a nice board mm -hmm. and I take off and, and I found out later he had the reputation for being a practical joker. Uh -huh. uh, and so it's, a, it's a beautiful wave and, and, and why man, when it gets, when it gets, when it's perfect, it has a west wheel, it comes in and, it's, and it hits the reef and it turns and it starts peeling like Honolulu. So you cannot just take off on an angle and go, okay, you know, I've got the good line, I'm good yep. because it will run you over. Yes. So you have to turn and go or almost top turn or like this picture I'll show you a little bit later on today of Pat Curran doing the speed crouch and driving across mm. in a good trim. You can't just take off an angle and think that's it. No. Uh -huh. So the, the, this was a wave. The, some of the waves, there's a wave in my mom's book that shows me sitting going over the top of wave and the guy's digging in his heels because he doesn't want to take off because it's fringing into the middle of the bay. But even though it was doing that this day, it would fringe, but it wouldn't break. It okay. would hold up. And so it was like almost user-friendly, big Y mail. Wow. I love um, that you mentioned your mom. I want to hear about your mom. And I also read a quote where when you were coming up, your mom said, Jock, it's about time you get out at it, Waimea. She was a water person, right? And she was. Okay. Because she had learned swimming up behind Los Angeles in the... Um, Barton Flats, Lake Arrowhead area, basically the foothills there, uh, San Bernardino, San Gregorio, th that, that area, because her mom was an outdoors woman and they had a cabin up there. I think they lived in Van Nuys or Northridge area before she met my dad. But, but mom uh, took that outdoors tendency when we moved to Hawaii in 52 because she had to raise us four kids. Mm -hmm. she, would, she would take us out in the ocean. She made sure that we learned to swim you know, become comfortable with the ocean as well as the mountains yep. from a very early age. So we we're all fairly competent, you know, Boy Scout, Girl Scout kind of, kind of people. Mm -hmm. But when we got old enough, like when I was 12 or 14, let me see, 1962, I was 14. She had flown past the Molokai coast one time going to Maui or the big island and seeing the north side of Molokai. She's going, wow, that's some nice wild country because none of the Hawaiian islands have roads going all the way around. Mm -hmm. But Molokai has got maybe one of some of the least, maybe Ni'ihau and, you know, Koholawe, Molokini, like that, Lanai have, have less. But so she, because she didn't have any money, you know, she went down and said, well, I'd like to travel that, 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 that nice wild country there. And so she went down to the east end uh, there's there's like a Kalapapa Peninsula kind of bisects the north side of Molokai. Mm -hmm. And on the south side of Kalapapa Peninsula is about 10, 12 miles of real steep sheer cliffs, deep valleys. Yep. And so she's, she really wanted to travel that coast, but she didn't have a boat. So she said, well, I'm going to have to swim it. So she got herself a semi-waterproof pack. What it was was an old typewriter styrofoam case that she managed to seal and put her, her camping gear and she towed it. Wow. For her first couple of times, she swam the 10 or 12 miles, not all in one leg, but she'd swim into the valleys, Wailau, uh, uh, Wailau, Waikolu, Halava Valley, and she would camp out in these valleys. And her, her uncle, my great uncle, used to work for the Coast and Geodetic Survey. It was 
to his house that my dad came in the 30s to ostensibly to go to college, but mostly he did. Mostly what he did was surf, mm -hmm. even though he was a pretty smart guy and he became an officer in the Coast Guard not too many years after that. That uh, my my mom ended up getting a Coast and Genetic Survey shack uh, deeded to her because she traveled that so much and she would use that as a camping spot, you know, to wait out, you know, if some surf came up, uh -huh. even though she was traveling mostly in the summer. But she wrote a great book about those travels. After she had swum it maybe two, three, four times, she had gotten a kayak, maybe because some of the local people in Molokai told her, look, you're gonna, somebody's gonna make you make a dinner out of you. Yeah. There's some big fish out there. And she, right. because the water's so deep, she said while she was swimming along, there'd be like 80, 100 pound of lure come up and go, what in the heck are you doing here? You look mm. at her kind of, <laughs> but <clears throat> because she was a gal and she you know, was spearing fish, even though she knew how to fish, she had helped my dad and his commercial fishing operation back in Surfside, back in the <clears throat> late 40s. And she said, she had kept a diary. I've got some of her old diaries, it killed her reading, that, that talk about <clears throat> her working for him for like, working with him for like three months and making uh, 40 bucks a month, you know, for a family of four. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, money went further back then, but she said she got tired of the winter storms coming up, bashing on her kitchen door there in Surfside, you know, every other winter. Uh, but after my dad took us over to Hawaii, she went. She took. She had to take a couple of years, ten more years, to raise us kids to the point where we were somewhat self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, my brother was probably only seven, eight years old, and my younger sister was nine or ten. I was, you know, fourteen. I was learning how to spare fish, you know, mm -hmm. and bring home some bacon for the for the family because my dad was out to sea, and mom was working for the Army Education Center, and so. Sometimes if it wasn't for my bringing home some fish, it'd be rice and beans for dinner. Mm, mm, wow. So we, we were not a rich family. As a lot of us, you know, a lot of us surfers grew up with the same kind of atmosphere. Yep, had yep, to, yep. Had to learn. Yeah. Um, you found your way into contests. You, you won the 1970, 1967 Duke Invitational. At that time, contests were um, not for everyone, let's say. No, they weren't, but in, in, in Hawaii, the Makaha contest had been going strong uh, for 15 years or so, you know, 10 years, and it was still the granddaddy of surf contests, even though in Peru they, had a, they would have small contests in the East Coast, West Coast, uh, they would have contests. And it was great to meet when I started coming over in 66, people like Hoppy Swartz, Leroy Granis, guys that were from my dad's era. And they would tell me, oh, yeah, we, we knew so-and-so, you know, and so it all got tied together. Mm -hmm. But... In the summer of 66, after I started working for Hobie and I was living with my cousin in Del Mar, after a couple of months, he moved up to another lifeguard position in Seal Beach. And then he started working for the movies, uh, Stanley Kubrick and uh, George Lucas would come much later. But uh, he's after living in Seal Beach for a while, he moved back to Costa Mesa, got married and, and settled down. But uh, in that summer of 66, I got to the point where I was surfing some single A contests maybe by the end of June of 66. And, and by the end of July, going into August, I was in some triple A contests because I want, this wasn't that man, much competition because I was used to a little bit bigger ways. Yep. Uh, I do stuff like try a, 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 a floater. Back then, what would we call them? Elevator, roller coaster, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do a roller coaster on a six foot wave, and people go, wow, 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 that was cool. And I go, well, you know, this is, you know, this is what we're used to back home, you know. And then I learned to do watching, I don't know where I learned, to, maybe it was watching, no, it wasn't Jerry Lopez. I, I'd seen somebody, maybe, maybe Joy Cabello Rabbit doing side slips at, at Queens. Mm -hmm. And I learned to do that a little bit on a Bruce Jones shape. And, you know, it's basically hot dog. It's basically trick stuff. Uh -huh. Although, I, looking at, at some of the aerial stuff, you know, that guys do nowadays, those are not tricks. Though. That's, to back it up a little bit, when I was in at a contest in Peru in 67, Mickey Dora, I, my boards were too big. Brewer had made me some boards thinking I was going to be surfing mostly big ways, but they had the hot dog contest in front of the uh, Club Waikiki and Miraflores there in Lima. And I borrowed Mickey Dora's The Cat. And so I was doing some you know, fin drifts and fin first takeoffs and those, right? And afterward, Dora told me, you're a regular gymnast, ain't you, kid? You know, <laughs> I, I, which I go, oh, okay, okay. But, you know, it looks 
it looks like you know it's it's difficult stuff to spinners that's you know that's okay mm -hmm. standing on your head that's that's cool stuff i mean there's tricks and then there's stunts that are actually a little tougher to do like mm -hmm. say doing a stall at that pipe like butch would would do yep or you know head dips are, are fun to do mm -hmm. but you know dragging your hand and, pull, and waiting letting the two pass you stuff like this these are not stunts they're just maneuvers that are calculated to get you further back in the curl so the stuff that i was doing that the side slips actually you could call it a controlled stall but it was more of a stunt okay more okay. of a stunt yep there's a great story about you showing up very late to a heat at right the, in makaha can you tell that story yeah and about 1965 i don't think it was 66 but i had already i don't know enough david Nueva because he was already pretty big here in california and there was a junior's contest at makaha i'm pretty sure it was the fall of 66 maybe january december january december say of, of, of 65 and we lived on the north shore which is the other side of the island as makaha and, and, and we were dependent on the radio broadcast to let us know and and, and that morning they had said okay juniors event's not going to be held today mm -hmm. so we go, okay i'll go surfing out at church hunts so I'm surfing out Chun's and all of a sudden I look back to the house and there's a big white flag. Mom's waving the white flag. Ah! You know, and she, we have a ship's bell, an old brass ship's bell. And so she's ringing that and, you know, I go, oh, okay, you know. She gets in and she says, your heat's going to start in half an hour. You know, we got to get over there. I go, oh, man. Mm -hmm. So we drove around Kaina Point. Mm -hmm. You know, I would run out to, this is wintertime, I'd run out to make sure that the, 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 the mud puddles in front of us weren't so deep that we would get bogged, you know, on our way. And we went around, the, because going around the other way towards uh, the Eva Beach Waipahu side yes. wasn't, it, it was going to take too much time. So okay. we raced as much as you can call it racing around Makaha and I got there with 15 minutes left in my heat mm -hmm. out of an hour heat okay and I managed because I had a decent board and maybe it was a, a brewer board shape uh, at Moonlight Beach Surf Shop or something over here John Price and those guys from the old days and I, I tied David Nueva with my five ways but because I didn't have a six wave he wanted on a countback Hmm. But, uh, you know, that probably was my, even though I'd surfed in a couple of contests, uh, Surfboards Hawaii contests when I was a skinny little punk back when I was like 15 or so. And when Jeff Hackman was almost a shoe in mm -hmm. because his dad, Harry, had had him in the water surfing by the time he was 11, you know, surfing sunset from the time he was 11, 12 years old. Yep. He was already a very competent kid. And that's mm -hmm. where I first saw him in Haleiwa. You know, and he's, we went to Chun's store one time. And he says, cha, cha. Don't go over in there next door and buy a Terry burger. Go over here and buy a half pound of the meat from here and have them go over there and cook. You know? so, and he was into the vitamin E oil, the wheat germ oil. And his dad, Harry, was a, a good diver and a, and a surfer. And, and Jeff, it was astonishing for everybody in the surfing world to know that somebody was surfing Waimea when they were 12 years old. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about looking in and your mom waving. waving. So you grew up right. on the beach at the spot that is now known as Jocko's, named after you. Right. What was, what was it like living there, and what's it like having a surf spot named after you? Oh, it's it's cool. Uh, I mean, it's it, it was a natural outcome of uh, of the population of surfing and leashes because before, say, 1978 or 1980. Very few people were surfing in the front there because if you lost your board, the, the chances of it going on the rocks were like Honolulu Bay. Pretty, if not certain, you know, very good chance. Mm -hmm. Very good chance. And so we would surf there on our way back from, say, surfing Lani Akea or Chuns or something, coming back into the house. And because I had dove the area during the summer, I kind of knew what I was you know, what was going on. the bottom on and everything. Yeah. Yep. And so even to this day, after five, six hundred times of going in and out there, you know, I can come in on the back of a wave, you know, and even though it's, you know, eight, ten feet out, out, out back, I'll time it and I can come in there, you know, right away almost to the sand. But mm -hmm. it's it's dumb because mm -hmm. one little mistake, one little sideways push and your fin's gone. Right. <laughs> Do you still live in that house? No. Okay. Um, um, because after my mom died in, 19, in 2015, uh, my two sisters and brother wanted to pull their money out of the house, and there's no way I could buy them out because it's 17,000 square feet on the beach. And when mom bought it for 230,000 in 1994, 95, in the 20 years, in 20 ensuing years after 95, the 
the value of the, the house and land, mostly the land, uh, increased in value 12 times. Wow. Yeah. Damn. Um, 1969, uh, I, was, I, was, I was doing my uh, research, and in 1969, you were the winner of the surfer poll? Yeah, actually, that, that, that poll didn't come out until 1970. Okay. I didn't know about it until I was in basic training in the Army. Okay. And one of the drill sergeants, I was walking down the company street. I don't know what I was doing, walking out in the street. You know, maybe it was a weekend or something. Mm-hmm. I had a little free time. And one of the drill sergeants comes walking up to me with a copy of Surfer Magazine on his hand. He says, is this you? <laughs> <laughs> I went, oh, God, yeah, it's me. You know, and so immediately the, sp- the suspicion was that I was running away from something. They had done something bad that uh-huh. I wasn't telling about. You know, they, they, they couldn't see or they didn't, they didn't hear about, you know, on the surface. And so, therefore, I was suspect. Uh-huh. And so I was picked on after that for a few oh, months. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But, but 1969, you, I, now all the, all the sources that I've, uh, that I've gone to, they were, you, were, you were the best surfer in the world. No, you, no, 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 no. No? No, a lot of that is hyperbole. Driven. Okay. A lot of that is, well, we there, live in a lot of her hy- hyperbole. Yeah. Is so oh, common. yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's what having a sense of objectivity and a sense of humility and a sense of humor are all about, you know. Mm-hmm. If you need to be the, the butt of somebody's joke, you know, mm-hmm. so that they will ease up a little bit and the tension will be diffused from a situation that would be a, a potentially toxic, uh-huh. you do it. Yep. You make yourself the ass. Yep. You know? So you didn't feel like the best surf in the world in 1969? Oh, no. Oh, no. Because my peer group, Jeff Hackman, Kiki, Je- you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Lucas was a terrifically smooth surfer. And when he moved to Kauai, you know, I heard stories from like Wolfman, Bob Stay, mm-hmm. and, and, and people like that, that. They would come back from Kauai and, oh, yeah, you know, we were surfing outside Hanalei when I was 20, 25 feet, and, you know, I'm, I'm, or surfing Kalihi Wai. Mm-hmm. And then I got to meet guys la- later on, you know, a couple of decades later, like, Titus Kinimak and, yeah. and they hey Jack you know how's it going it's like okay you know I got some, some stuff to live up to here but because of that publicity you know it goes back to the, the the summer of 66 you know and then getting second in the world contest and then get, and then getting invited to a contest here in Peru and then I won the Alamoana co- the state contest uh-huh. three years in a row which is big feather in my cap yep. even though you know, other guys could have won. I just, I had some good equipment back then. And by 1968, short boards had come in and there were some good ways. And because I had surfed a lot on the North, I had, had put in my time on the North Shore enough that good size Alamoana was like, oh yeah, this is fun. You know, I'll try a late takeoff, no paddle, you know. So yeah. the, the sense of confidence and even overconfidence sure. was there. But uh, as far as the comparison to other surfers in the world at that time, how did I consider myself? I don't know, number 12 or 15. I don't okay. know. Yeah, uh-huh. because there was, first off, there's guys like that, that Hackman and I grew up admiring. Like, you know, Joey Cabell was, was always a pretty dang good surfer. Mm-hmm. We, we admired him. He had, he had his own opinion of himself, which is cool, but he was a good sailor. You know, he spent a lot of time skiing, but when we'd see him in the water, we'd be going, dang, that's some wave judgment. Yep. But got stylists like Paul Strau, mm-hmm. or, you know, or, or Philly Edwards, you know, yeah. we'd see him. Yep. Or then, we, then by the time 16, 69 rolled around, we were becoming, you know, aware of Skip Fry, Mike Henson, you know, and David Nueva. You know, David was a good surfer, a little showy, but he was competent. You yeah. Know? But he, in some instances, it's, you know, I love the guy. But mm-hmm. I was even his roommate, and I beat him in a contest at Carlsbad during the summer of 66, and I think I was staying with him at the, at the time. I'd gotten a ride down to the contest with him, and the ride back home was very quiet. <laughs> I love the guy. You know, I like it's like guy. that. I yeah, understand yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So jumping back, I wanted to ask you about 1989, and I want oh, to yeah, make yeah, sure yeah. it's okay to get into that with you. It is. It was, it was selfishness okay. on my own part, and it was lack of humility because of the... Not only the ease, but because of the attractiveness and the euphoria and the lack of a sense of more valuable things to spend my time on. I became basically a, I don't want to say a full-on addict, but it was just too close not to Mm -hmm. call it that. Mm -hmm. And so basically I became concentrating more on 
on feeling good. You know, I was still taking care of work, and there was there was project that pretty much demanded my time. But I just I just waste a lot of energy and probably a good amount of health. And eventually, because I went to jail for a couple of years because of my thinking that I could smuggle some cocaine from L.A. into Hawaii and someone whose name I will not name, but I found out because my friend's sister worked in the DEA and she said, yeah, this guy that you know very well is a friend of your brother's, he probably dropped, dropped a dime on you. And so they were, they were, they were waiting for me at the airport hmm. and I had like a pound of cocaine with me. Was it in your bag? Was it in your... Yeah, it was in my carry-on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so you walk off the plane and then I suddenly... I walk off the plane and they say, we'd like you to come with us. Wow. Yeah. And they had already, they had, they had planted a guy on the plane because they had already known before I left Los Angeles that I was carrying, mm -hmm. that I was muling. Mm -hmm. And so my mom, you know, my, my brother uh, and my brother's wife had already seen that notice in the newspaper. And so they had me come down, you know, and have supper at mom's house and broke the news to mom. And it was pretty much as bad as when I told her I had signed up for the army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And mm -hmm. I was probably going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. She's going, what? <laughs> you what? You know, oh, man. Because she knew what it was like in Vietnam. And if it wasn't for a friend of mine who was also a surfer in the training affairs office there at basic training in Fort Ord in 1971, I probably would have, I was being trained uh, in, in AIT, which is the next phase of your training after basic. I was being trained as a field wire repairman, a telephone pole climber. Okay. So probably if I, a lot of the guys, I saw my bunkmate from, from basic in Waikiki about 10 years later. And I go, Ernie? Fukeda was his last name. John? Yeah, hey. You know, what happened to the other guys? Oh, a lot of them went to, to Nam, didn't come back. Infantry. Wow. We lost a lot of guys, you know, mm -hmm. bad, bad reconnaissance, you know. Mm -hmm. So after that time, did you want to get back into the surfing game or were you happy to move on with your well, life? It wasn't a game because back then... Surf, surf contest. There was no money back then, mm -hmm. but it, it was it was fun stuff to do. And because because sponsorship was was a tangible thing. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine, uh, Kiki Spangler's brother, Randy, was in the movie um, movie location business. Okay. He had recommended me to he, he had he had recommended me to a to a lady, uh, Muffy who was like a casting director and she got me an ad with the Carnation Instant Breakfast uh, where I did a, a little serving part and a speaking part where I'm, I'm taking some instant breakfast and going, all I need to go on in a glass, go, 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 go. Oh yeah, yeah. I used to have that stuff in the morning when I was a kid. Yeah. Carnation yeah. Instant Breakfast, chocolate well, malt. Yeah, one of the earth's early protein drinks. Yeah. And I got residuals, probably a total of 25 or 3,500 bucks, which when you're 18, 19 years old is a ton of dough. Sure. Plus, you know, you see the check on the mail and you're going, woo. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so after I got out of the army, I wasn't too concerned with surfing and contests, but I still, because I had been surfing fairly consistently while I was there in the army, weekends and whatnot, mm -hmm. or after, after hours. But, uh, Got to surf Santa Cruz as well as a couple of places there in, in Monterey. But uh, I came back and I, I had been sending money back from my pay, you know, to my mom and stuff. And and she was, of course, much relieved that I didn't have to go to Vietnam. Mm. And so when I came back in the first month or so, I was working maybe at a surf shop in in town on Kapilani, but maybe for country surfboards or something. And then some friends said, "Hey, you know, about two months later, maybe January of." 1972, I said, hey, you know, you need a, need a roofing job, you know. So I had already, you know, been pretty handy with you know, helping mom and dad around the house and whatnot, knew, knew what a hammer and nail were about. And so I started off maybe earning eight or ten dollars a day mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And finally worked my way up the ladder to where now I can earn 60 to 80 bucks an hour doing piecework mm -hmm. uh, and even more if if the if the job is set up nicely but the the physical taxing has just got to the point where I'd rather not do it but back then I still wanted to enter, in, enter some surf contests and maybe entered a couple Alamoana contests you know when Ben Ipa mm -hmm. was one of my one of my 
uh, main challengers, but uh, there's a contest out on the North Shore, a Haleiwa Amateur Contest that had a Japanese uh, division and stuff. And so I liked entering contests still, mm -hmm. you know, and, but I still had the sense of the old contest, which was if somebody hadn't gotten a wave, you didn't, and the wave was coming more to you, but he was in the area, you grabbed him practically and you got him on it. You know, it was, it was the sportsmanship thing yeah, was still sure. very big, yep. still very big. And even when, when money came into the contest, there was still that element and it's still there mm -hmm. to some degree, mm -hmm. a lot less. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Wrapping this up now, my, my final question, and, and it's an impossible question, and you can laugh no, at me no, if you no, want, no, but no, the no. question is so general, and that is, all these, this epic odyssey of surfing that you've experienced, what have you, what's you, what have you most learned away? What is the good life? What, what, how do we live the good life? I'm always, ask, I'm always curious about that, and it's so damn broad that it's a ridiculous question, but I'm always curious. You're living the good life, clearly. What is it? How do, how do we do it? We maintain our stretching in a consistent manner, and our diet if, as much as we can help it and surround ourselves by people that love us and, and have equal interests and be compassionate, you know, for people that don't have as much or, or have poorer equipment than you do and give them a push in, you know, if I've, I've pushed pee into waves and I've had guys probably 20 or 30 times going, hey, can you do that for me? <laughs> but my mom had, used to have a list of 15 things or so that you should be able to do by the time you're 15. And they're all practical things like being able to change a diaper, being able to balance the family checkbook, be able to hold a conversation with, with adults, be able to see something that needs to be done and do it without being an initiative, you know, be able to use public transportation, get across a strange city, you know, all these very, very practical things. Mm -hmm build a fire, mm -hmm. you know, learn how to cook a simple meal. So it was a good lesson for me, but to, to be able to enjoy the life we have, we need to be in shape, we need to have a sense of humor, Yeah. but we also need to have a, a good enough sense of agility and sense of anticipation, which is what surfing is kind of is all about. But surfing is very much a part of the, good, the goodness that is the human experience nowadays, um, Jamie. Thank you so much. It's been great talking My pleasure. To you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Our theme song is Ohana by Farmer Dave and the Wizards of the West. Soundings is brought to you by the Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. The Surfer's Journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. Thank you for listening to Soundings, and until next time.